Hello everybody and welcome to my next show with Tony Blake where today we're going to talk about sacred images in the 21st century. So Tony, is there a difference between sacred art and objective art? Oh, you land me in the doodah straight away, don't you? Of course. <laughs> of course you do. Well, I'm going to uh, so fend off that one I guess, for a little while and mention that I'm interested in such things and what I do about my interest is that I create a seminar about them and invite some interesting people in, but just people, you know, and hoping that together something emerges between us and not, in other words, I get more than what happens to be in my head, my memory and what I believe I understand, but something will generally emerge of itself. So that's, that's the background for me talking to you because I, I want have this chance of this conversation because it may help the process of the seminar itself. As I, I say, a seminar isn't just when you, you know, from whatever day it is, Thursday at 7 and Sunday at 1, and that's the seminar. I think the seminar goes on before that and it should go on after that. You know, it's, it's a living thing. Okay, so I said all that. And maybe, I can't promise to get round to this objective art thing, I say this objective art thing because I've heard it whenever I hear the words now I tend to cringe because of this sort of, I don't know what to call it, sort of anxiety. People have heard it from Mr. Goethe, of course, about objective art. and But there's a kind of ongoing current of frustration because nobody really gets it really. What well, on earth he meant by it, you see. So, and all the time, People looking for a scapegoat, something to take it out on. <laughs> they don't understand it. <laughs> kind of well, that's, that's my sort of feeling about it. Because um, Spensky says in, uh, I think it's uh, fragments that it's an objective piece of art. For example, is the Sphinx. Yes. So it's something that, when you look upon it, it's not just seeing it, but you feel it. There's something. Um, maybe a mystery about it that you know it, it has something to tell you rather than just looking at a piece of art and saying oh that's a painting of a nice landscape for example <laughs> okay you know I find uh, an approach here that, but I need to go to the rationale so to speak uh, purpose of uh, what are called sacred images. Um, we know that people over a long time have invested a lot of energy in them. Uh, and we suppose that they consider these images to contribute something very significant to their life, the way they lived their life and also to communities and the rest of it. And there is, I want, I want to begin with the side of it, which is fairly obvious, which is that the sacred image is something can invest in, so to be put something into, and thereby it, it can grow, even, you know. It can, obviously a sacred image is not a thing floating around out there, you know, like a, a species of animal or rock or something like that. It's something to do. First of all, it's an image. And you've got this conundrum, or challenge, whatever it is, that these images you know, are made by people. You see? Yet, why call them sacred? Because we made them. You know, part of that can be correlated with this mystery or concern about the sacred text, such as the Quran or the Bible, when the proponents of that particular religion say, this is the word of God. You see? And I mention this because I want, again, right near the beginning to say that the sacred image, if it's taken to be sacred, it communicates something. The people is not just something people like or is attractive or that you put on the walls or whatever it is, it, it communicates something, it is a presence. Um, I'm interrupting whenever you want to with the questions about mm -hmm. this, because I want to jump now to um, the particular example, um, 
of the icons, the new Byzantian icons in particular, or the particularly Russian Orthodox tradition of this, which is beautifully brought out in Tarkovsky's film Andrei Brobyev. Um, and we know we have a very wonderful friend who does them, actually composes them, you know, in, in these times, and they have something of the same power. And I was seeing this program on, I admit it was on BBC4, a brilliant program by Zanting Hart and talking to these people, but a present day icon painter and then to a priest, and the priest um, emphasized how, you know, the, in his tradition, you know, it's still very powerful for the people, and why? Because you know the the icons were usually representing a saint, so they were a link to that saint, to that being. You know, they weren't just a sort of when we have the idea of representation or picture of it's like it's not the real thing. No, but in a sense, if it's a good icon, the real thing is there. And so the people. You see them; they they kiss the icon as, as if they would the hand of the sacred person. You know, in front of the priest or, or the saint or whatever it is. <clears throat> so, so, this, so it's a carrying on of that saint. If done, his uh, his or her attributes are coming through that yes. iconic picture. Absolutely, and people believe they get help that way. Now, I'm jumping here because I mean, this is quite a wide canvas we've got to have, and it maybe. I, you could lose track in all of this, but you have to remember that you know, Gurdjieff himself uh, seemed to have um, a familiarity with sacred images. They were part of his upbringing and also part of his uh, transmission. And uh, recently I was doing a seminar in Spain in which I introduced this well, two things was a movement and the inner exercise. And this inner exercise comes one of the few, came more or less directly from Goji, of course, the exercise sometimes of conscious stealing or the four prophets, um, in which you go to, directed to go to the sacred places such as the Benares, and um, you make contact in a certain method with the energy there and, and take it into your own work and it has implications and responsibilities for oneself. But it is a very good example of something where the raw material is put in by people, the ordinary people. And everywhere, if you look in these traditions, it is Buddhist or Christian, Islamic, you have pilgrimage. And people, the point is to go through difficulties to go to this place to get a blessing. And it's a whole technology, and it really interests me a lot. Because it's part of the sacred image. You see, if you imagine a shrine of the tomb of a saint, which is very common in Islam, and these beautiful tombs. You know, if you've seen them in the class, this tomb with roses and and all this kind. Of, but it's the you see what's happening. People come to them. Um, they're bringing energy. And you know, we, you once had the All in Everything Conference in Canterbury. You know, Canterbury was the Canterbury Pilgrims was in Chaucer's poem about that. And, and it's lovely because it just shows ordinary people bumbling around to this place. But, but by their efforts, it's just like do work and they come together. But then, Gurdjieff said, something gets distilled. And this is an important thing to add into the picture because it's not just um, a composite of putting it, but something gets. You know the word distilled? Mm -hmm. yes. Finer energy comes off, which somehow leaves behind the, the um, desires and the arguments and the cheating, because they're just people coming in. They just get this, this energy. And Gurdjieff then said, well, just, there's very few people can do anything with this energy. It just lies of it. If we can enter it into our transformation, we can go further. Then he has some extraordinary things to say how beings can manifest in, in the world through this. But it gives us a picture because it means that the people, how people make it, this is not just like the icon painter who will undergo austerities sometimes of fasting 
and uh, contemplation and so on um, to make the arguments that people can, can then contribute to it because all the icon put into a church and all these thousands of people giving it reverence charges it up. Yeah. So, yeah. so it becomes like a, excuse me, not a battery, but a, a transformer, maybe, mm -hmm. or... Well, you see, I mind you just now, I heard recently about it, because we often use the word accumulator. You know? Accumulator, that's it, yes. Yeah, it's like a battery, mm -hmm. isn't it? So we, you know, so we have some accumulators, and we need to be connected with big accumulators. Mm -hmm. And in a way, these, these sacred images are like big accumulators. Um, and it's be just almost a kind of matter of common sense to participate in them and, 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 and appreciate them and make use of them. But it's become quite difficult for people now who say, you know, turned away from religion, they're not going to venerate an icon because they think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Christian, I'm not don't believe in God and all that kind of thing. So people are a bit um, cut off from the traditions in that respect, you see. But when you spoke about an object of art, at least you get the sense that something appears to really happen to people. With these things, and there is, I'm going to call in this conversation, um, a substance in them. Now, I call it a substance because I want to distinguish you see, from, in this term, an image. People can think of a picture, it's like having a picture. There's far more than having a picture. You see, like a picture is flat, you know, it's, it is what you you hang on the wall. But the sacred image is, it's not just picture. It's, as I see, like the thing about the icon and the saint, it's actually the, there's the presence of the saint. And I call this the substance, so substantial. Um, uh, so I suppose we're giving something to it because we're going to view it but it's giving us something back for viewing it, if we're viewing it in a right frame of mind and, and feeling. It means we can be engaged with it. You, know, you, see, you, know, you see, like that, you can enter into it, it can enter into us, and there is a rapport, feeling between, and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and people traditionally know, and I, my mind, the images from this film, you know, just the, woman with her own shrine of Madonna in her house and she incense, she offers it up. Imagine doing every day with life. You've, you've got this practice of investment. It's the same in the Buddhist tradition, Hindu tradition, over and over. It's sort of like giving something to it, which is connected with what is called, and another difficult thing for a modern person, worship. Because people get very disturbed these days. They say, worship, I mean, you're kowtowing to some imaginary superior being. You know, we don't do that because we're educated, civilized people. We don't want to do that anymore. So we don't have any worship. Um, because, well, the backstory to that is because we feel we, nothing is superior to us. Yeah. <laughs> we're the acme of creation, which is what we can do. So, would, we're still making a context for describing what the sacred image is. Yeah. There is, um, I think, a need for a little addition about Jinnurva images. I'm thinking of the uh, bringing in the Tibetan tradition because what is called visualization. Uh, is incredibly important practice. And the one form of the traditional practice is very interesting. It's like you, what you, you visualize a deity, and that has to be as concrete, brilliant as possible. You know the color of the matters and the form, and the apparatus, and the awareness of the qualities supposed to be in in that in that image. But then, in one practice, what you do is you split it into two, so you have two. Copies, and then into four, and then to eight, 
then to 16, as many as you could take it, keeping this concrete awareness of each one. This is the practice, which is incredibly hard in a way. And then, when you finish, you bring them all back together again and make one. So it's a very, very strict discipline, I say. And I've mentioned it, say, it's in, that it can demand an engagement which is very demanding. And we have to appreciate it, not I say, something silly like, I say, like a picture on the wall at all. I mean, it takes guts. But all that concentration that's being put into it from the artist, obviously because they're mm -hmm. contemplating what they're working on and what that saint, mm -hmm. they say they're doing a painting a saint, what that saint's attributes are, yeah. need to be put into that painting. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't have like just whimsical ideas going on in your mind no, no, while no, you're no, doing no. this no, kind no. of thing. No, no, you've got to do that. And, uh, but I also want to em emphasise that it's, it's the kind of visualisation which um, um, I used to practice it with Mr. Bennett and so on. Um, it was taken for granted we ought to do that, but it seems that people have lost touch with it about c um, creating these kinds of uh, mental images. Um, but everybody who wants to understand something needs this. Because I want to now add another dimension to this talk, that science. You see, it might seem got nothing to do with sacred images. But just to emphasize that they can, uh, in the images, can be almost tangible um, and one can learn from them. Because this is what Einstein did in his series of relativity. I mean, equations and all that came later. Because he contemplated everything. He contemplated, that's right, he got into it. He, he, you were seeing light photons or light, you know, in terms of light, uh, light rays and so on, and 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 it, and it was quite well known at the beginning of the 20th century. You did that sort of thing, but you didn't talk about it very much because you know your people imagine they are the technical scientists who really not created. It, didn't uh, imagine you you sort of did rational thought all the time and you calculations, but in fact you just have to. Well, we call it imagine it. They've got a problem. Imagine, people think imaginary is th something thin, you know. It's and it's only what comes out of your mind. But no, like Einstein only feels young. But only by creating these images, you begin to see things which you wouldn't have seen unless you've done that. So invest in something which turns out to be wiser than you are. And and I just don't say this happens in science. You see. Uh, and Mr. Bennett said that this is how it is in, in sacred images. It's like, what well, we put this nice word sacred in front of it because in a way it becomes more than we are. If it's the real job, well, not just, that's nice, you know. No. Uh, So it can help, and and he pointed out that people just won't get it. But if I've made it up, how what good is it? Because I've just made it up. It's um, it's made up of my making it up kind of thing. It's just my memories and prejudices and projections and stuff. You know, like you, you you start this, get into it, and something grows and develops, gets stronger, and it's a substance and it can have an effect on you. In fact, we can like draw you on. And so these kinds of um, visualizing are there for that kind of purpose of drawing you on and uh, to make you more, you see, and to sorry, lift you out of yourself. <laughs> like a sky hook, you know, it's all something in the sky. And why? Because it's, it's a true intermediary between us, in ordinary state, and the higher worlds. You know, and actually, uh, I love that word I got it from the science fiction writer Clipper Simmo, way station. It's a way station. It's a way station. All right, okay. And who, what author did you just mention? Science fiction? Uh, Clipper Simmo. Oh, right, yes. Okay. I think, uh, yeah. Uh, he has uh, this chap in the country in America, and he's got a way station in his barn. 
<laughs> with people visitors of the galaxy come through. But I, I just loved it, you know. But it, it's like this is a portal, this is an entry. Because it should be inspiring, this kind of art, shouldn't it? Yeah. This iconic art, inspiring you yeah. to go to the higher, yes. higher mind, higher levels. Yes. But this is positive, and you just we can oh, let's do it now. It's the. Uh, uh, I'm jumping to another parallel. It's like for me, like music is intrinsically like this because it connects us with the realm of a higher language, uh, a higher seeing or insight. And all kinds of music can do this, but that's a, another matter. So, yeah, way station. Mm. So, when you were just saying about music, music is, would you say it's on the same kind of sacred music, would be on yes. the same level as sacred art? Yes. It's still yeah. an insp inspiration. Mm. Yes. Well, that's, you know, what um, the, the intentionality of people in the beginning days, we talk about the Western tradition. Middle Ages and so on. It was entirely that. It was, if you like, it was the um, the sound of the angels, mm -hmm. you know, literally. But it meant literally, this kind of thing. But in those kind of times, in the medieval times or such, like they haven't got TV or radio to distract them. That's right. So that when they do go and see a proper work yeah, of art yeah. like that, they are absolutely oh, twenty first no, no. century wowed by it. That's so true. It reminds me of, uh, you know, I think, I really slowly understanding this, that I, I, I have an image in my mind of Wells Cathedral and a reconstruction of how it looked originally, because you look at Wells Cathedral, now it's incredible, like a beautiful thing, and thing, but statues and so on. But when it was originally put up, it was all in Technicolor. You know that. Was Cathedral? You yes. know that already. Well, in um, that special stained glass window that they've they've lost how it's made, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Well, it's one thing. The actual front, the statues were painted. You know, oh, were they? Oh, I didn't know that. No. I know. You see, they've tried to reproduct it. It's absolutely, I'm literally Hollywood Technicolor. And imagine, I just blew my mind. Imagine the people, as you say, often living very grubby and hard lives and dingy lives, coming to that. It was paradise. Stained glass windows, but every statue, and there was so much, um, you know, destruction from which I'm also beginning to appreciate in England because of that horrible person, Henry VIII, who just wanted money. But the destruction of art in these, you know, mm. statues had their heads knocked off and stained glass windows smashed, beautiful things, but anyway, but that. As you say, I'm just amplifying about the colour, and it was so it was an intensity, and we don't very difficult for it to get this intensity. Because colour is quite magical in that kind of way, whereas black and white doesn't perhaps take us, mm. or monochrome doesn't take us no. that level up. Well, you know, in, in, in Tibetan tonkas, is it they call them? You know, they, they, it, all the colour is so significant. The kind of colour you have, you have mm. with the goddess or god, all this kind of thing. And, it brings that kind of icon painters and so on, and the choice of the colour is meaningful, and it's a language itself. So, now, we're thinking of trying to get towards this uh, 21st century, and I was looking at the example of, I hope I get his name right, the, I think, American artist Toro, or Toro. One of the things he's done, he actually bought uh, an extinct volcano and it turned it inside into a work of art, which is where it has openings in, in which allow light in. And he composed this thing of light from the sky and all these colors. And I was looking at this and wondering why they. Um, New kind of sacred image because it's in a way secular. I mean, it's it's, it's not attached to any particular religious imagery. It's just as you mentioned, color. Mm. It just you you just get a sense of worship of color. It's just it's just amazing. It just you just pure color, and it's some resonances with the art of Mark Roscoe, 
and I adore the the chapel, you know, the special Roscoe Chapel near some of his campuses. His ca these campuses are almost entirely, in a sense, black. And have you ever seen pictures of this? You know, yeah, you know it. And it was, um, and special music was made for it, and so on. You see, but all this black thing because there's something about. Well, one phrase comes into my mind about the mm, the unknown God. God beyond form and all this sort of thing is, is something which has become very near or accessible in the, in the now in the 21st century. Of course, in the world, we're completely okay with uh, black holes and that kind of jazz, gravitational waves and so on. And, and the sense of the invisible calling to us is there. So maybe we're creating another kind of iconography um, out of this. And these artists are trying to do this. And it's different from the approach of another artist I very much admire. I think he may be Australian, I can't remember. His name is Bill Viola. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, no. He's known about the world's leading, um, what do you call it, installation artist who makes videos. And clearly he made a set, it was 10 years ago now, for St. Paul's Cathedral. So they're actually, they're like triptychs, but they're videos. And some of them are taken from the Bible, but he's recreated these images and even like, like of angels or people going into other dimensions and enacting them. And it's done in the most extraordinary way. Mm. So is this like um, uh, projected onto the walls of St. Paul's? No, well, no, actually, you know, <coughs> screens, you know, which oh. are kind of big, big TV screens. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, it is a little plug here for my. Diversity publication. They just I took on a couple of one, which is a representation of the Pieta Mary with Jesus, and he's composed it, and it's done live, but in a very accordingly sensitive sense. But in this way, you see where the, here the, the, the technology of cinema is uh, is used. You know, as a previous example was this abstraction. You know, in color. Like one of these devices he uses, is actually, it, it takes days to set up properly. It's, it's a thin sheet of running water, and his performers, you know, walk through this sheet, and it's totally. You actually like it's like seeing transformation in front of your eyes, it's, but it requires days to set up this 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 film of water in space. You know, so they they're doing that. Um, so again, they're like the old icon painters. They're putting a lot of work in and contemplation, yeah, yeah. dedicating themselves to that piece of uh, art. Yes, yes. <clears throat> which then 21st century people are going to look at. Because even though you, you know, we're saying not many people are religious anymore, they still get drawn to this kind yeah, of they art, do. don't yeah, they? they? So do. there's a hunger yeah. in them. They know this. Yeah, the they might not there. know why they're doing it, yeah. but they get something from yeah. it. Yeah. Only. It reminded me that the essential part of this is, of course, not of course, uh, that's a phrase I often use, it's not coming to mind, is a lot of them is, is, is you make something concrete, you know, you, it's, it's something tangible you're dealing with. Um, even the light one in some ways is tangible because to do, you have to get something which is made there, created there. I'm not sure, here I'm really, really searching for it. Is that well, not because, but now I'm going to go and introduce yet another dimension to all of this, which is to do with nature. And maybe the beginning of sacred images in the world around us. And one example are to do with stones. Uh, uh, begin with one kind of example which struck me very much from Amarin, the Indian tradition. It's called the, it's a stone in Utah called the birthing stone. Because it's, you get the stone, it's just like, just on the landscape, it's just this big rock. And they put drawings on it. It's called birthing because there's a kind of woman figure giving birth to something. But 
this is attractive because you do, if you can picture it, just this rocky landscape, pretty de like a desert, and you get this kind of lump just stuck there, and it's uh, maybe it come from you know, previous geological ages, like previous puzzle in Europe about what's called erratic blocks. There were these great lock rocks left on the plain. I wonder how they got there. In fact, it was left by glaciers. But it, it always has a power, that mystique around them. You see? And then we... So is it called petroglyphs? Is that yeah, what petroglyphs, yeah. You okay. put them in, in, in the rock and so on, but then they put it there. It's, it's an example because it's, it's there by nature, so to speak, and then the people get attracted to it and they put their marks on it and people can then come and visit it. And some of them, sites like that, say, in Australia, have been worked with over thousands of years and the drawings have gone into it. But then I jumped from that to, um, you see, the Kaaba. Was he? In Mecca. In Mecca. You know what's in, in the Kaaba? Well, isn't it a meteorite? That's right, it's said to be a meteorite stone. It's a black rock, isn't it? Black rock. It was the day from the time of Abraham, even from Adam and Eve, and it's very, very strange also. It's mostly what caused the Kaaba, you know, the enclosure is, is empty, and it's like there's even special occasions where people can go inside it. And the actual rock itself is only in one corner of the Kaaba, and there's an opening people can look at it, and it's very, very strange associations and so on. And but do they walk, is this where they walk around? Yes. And why do you think they walk around it? Is it to charge it? Oh, that's the worst. That's, that's the question. I mean, the simple answer is, you know, you give the pilgrim something to do. You know, you know, it just, you know, that's that. But, um, but maybe they get something, maybe they get charged from it by doing do. something like that. Because this is then another, develop this one about the Mecca, it goes to this writer Ibn Arabi. You, you know, Ibn Arabi, of course, the Andalusian saint who wrote about you know, 10,000 books or something. And, and, greatest brains of the age. Well, he had a series of books called the Meccan Revelations. Because in, in his circumambulations, he, he said something happened to him, which is like a revelation. And this is very important in Islamic mysticism because of the, well, because of the dangers of even speaking about a revelation after the prophet. That was a finish and so on. And so it's very, very sensitive. and trying to lead up to something here, because part of the Meccan revelations was about this, and when he was doing this, and he was so angry, I think we do it seven times, and see some films, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people doing this. There's only one of the sacred sites in, in Mecca, there are other places, like there's a, a stone that represents the devil, you have to throw stones at it. Well, I don't know that one. I, thought, I knew there was meant to be five or seven secret sites, yeah, but I didn't know that one. No. Okay. And you, you get it, it's fun. And, uh, <laughs> then we go out to, and what it was in, Ibn Ari says he was going round and he was, some of his, um, he was creating poetry and content speaking out loud, and there was this touch on his shoulder. I love this story. And he turned around and there was this beautiful young woman, who was known as Lady Nazim. Lady Naz Nazim. 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 Uh, and he's quite frank about it. I mean, one thing is she began to criticize what he was saying and pointing out his errors, theologically, pointing out his errors. And he writes about it saying she was you know, divine in intellect. You know, she was the greatest mind she ever met and completely knew Islam. But he's incredibly missed. He's beautiful, gorgeous, you know, that kind of thing. Now, in a way, that's a sacred image. Now, this relates to something very strong in, not simply in Islam, of course, but, well, I won't go too far back, we will start with, in the Bible, Sophia, wisdom. Wisdom, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you find there's a thread associated with the image of woman. Always. Um, this extends you know, to almost the modern age in Goethe. I don't know if you go to the German writer, the poet, he talked about the eternal feminine drawing people on. You see, this is a sacred image. You see, it's one of the most powerful in all these traditions. Uh, 
and because right back you will know him, the one who talked about the famous Dante. You know Dante, yes. yeah. The Divine yeah. Comedy. Divine Comedy, you know it. Who was the great inspiration? It was uh, Be Beatrice. Be Be I said Beatrice. Beatrice. And now I can't spell it properly. Because in Faust, um, going back to Goethe, he wanted, um, Faust wanted to see uh, Helen of Troy, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so that yeah. was his drive. Right. So it's always a, a beautiful woman. Exactly. That's so true. Although you introduced something I don't to mention here because of the ways there are dark images, as so to speak, or inferior images, or whatever it is. Secular images are just secular. But even the Helen of Troy, maybe it's the same thing. Uh, there's, it has to be the feminine. And, and there's the idea of the, because always in, but often in relationship to men who are taken out of themselves, they are unable to transcend themselves through the feminine. And this is so strong in all the traditions, and I think it's magnificent and powerful. You know, so the Lady Nazim, the Ibn Arabi, was one of the, is that because he was, he recognized the power, and he, Afterwards, you, know, you can say, well, did she exist? Was it his poetry, whatever? Like you know, Dante's Beatrix, you know, which just appeared in his poetry. No, they, and like, you know, he said, it actually was a concrete person. Oh, so okay. did so that. it wasn't an angel? No, she wasn't an angel. no, that's right. Yeah, you know, and, and the appearance and so like, I'm putting this in because I don't know. Because, I, but, but damn it all, there's got to be something really mysterious about sacred images, you know. You know, as if we could sort of, Get a, go to the factory of sacred images and turn out a new one. You know. But uh, the turn of family, because it goes back to this, you know, it's political gender kind of controversy about the early evolution of mankind and the mother goddess, you know, which is why is it that the only the great imagery of thousands of years ago was a, was a female? There's hardly any imagery of men at all. This is decidedly weird. You know, we talk about the Venus, the Paleolithic Venuses, and all of that, and, and then we have these glib things of worshipping fertility, you know. Yeah, I was going to say that the academics call them fertility goddesses, yes. but we don't know, do we? No, we don't. It's a bit kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of safe la label, isn't it? We've got a good representation of that. Yeah, but you imagine this, and then that ties in with something which is maybe will connect us back to the theme a bit, but uh, it came up. And I'd just been in Spain doing the seminar, and just in, in the course of that came about the change which happened, and it's recorded in the mythologies, where we had the mother, and that phone seems to be so prevalent. Then the mythology, she gives, she has a son. Uh, then mythology, but it seems to be what happened is that the son assumes power and the mother recedes. It seems to happen everywhere. And do you know what some people are relating this to? It's very interesting. I don't know if you, if you like this. If you said if there was a I had to change the language a little bit, there's a book I'll refer to here called by a man called Sinclair Sinclair called the Master in his emissary, but it should be the mother and her son. Uh, because she gives birth to the son, and the son takes things his way and even can kill the mother or hide the mother. And all these elements go back to the Sumerians, even. And you can see those elements. Um, so it's some kind of domination from the younger son over his yeah, mother. The, you know, some, the sun, the also the male energy coming in, because there's this question, you know, often they say, you know, biologically, um, um, you, you know, biologically, the natural form is a woman, and it, it has to be modified to get a man. You know, man is a mutant, a defect, in the kind of thing. Then, but what is related to is, of course, this popular idea now of the two brains, the left and the right brain. And the right brain is the mother. And the left brain is the sun, and it's 
in some traditions, is, is two sides of the brain is represented sometimes in terms of the heart and the brain, because I can't quote precisely who is the source of this, but the idea that this head brain and so on grew out of the heart. Is it? Uh, yeah, you don't know. Yeah, no, I didn't know that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, this corresponds to the sense that the master and his emissary, this is the two muscles, his right brain, he rise to the left brain, which then is like a wicked Greek story usurped the true god or, or source. Mm, so that, <coughs> this is where the mind or the brain yes. usurps the heart? Yes. And. They, and See, well, I'm now changing Mother Nature, the Mother, whatever it is, you know, uh, in the divine wisdom gave rise to this, which could invent technology and science and have this vision because there's something which comes in the left brain, which the right brain cannot provide. But one interesting, important distinction between the two, which I always go back to, because it's interesting in itself, is that it's only the right brain which has direct experience. Therefore, it doesn't have direct experience at all. Because that's where our imagination and things comes from. Well, isn't yeah, it? yeah. And also based on uh, symbols, codes. You see, you put names on them. You've got the names. You've got the symbols. You see, but there's no content really. It's not. There's no smells in it. You know what I mean? There's no color in it either. It's just code. So it's you can see the digital age. It's just zeros and ones. That's everything. Everything gets reduced to it. And Gurdjieff's language is very nice about this because that's I think where he put. There's many things, but one aspect of it is what he put the formatory apparatus and what the formatory do. All it does is file things. Whatever happens to us is you put it under C, but under this, whatever. It, it doesn't feature sure what anything is. It just has to be given its name and filed away. You see, that brain is like in the personality, and it's like a filing clerk. That's all it is, but there's m more to it than that because it's able to deal with abstract symbols, you know, kind of thing. But so we get, and this is a imagery because there's well, not because what you get. This itself is a powerful image. Oh, these two brains. Um, because then I used to wonder: is the point of us to evolve to try and bring these two brains together? But then why? Why do we have two separate ways of, of thinking? Yeah, well... And it's interesting you say it comes up from the heart. I'm going to have to ponder on that. I've never yeah. heard that before. I, I feel there's something from yeah. in there, isn't you there? See, the technology is now interrupting us, you know, saying, yeah, hello again, I'm, very, I'm beautiful and so on. <laughs> but I mean, if I recall, this is... Um, this is like Mr. Ben is saying, this is going to start with some words, uh, going about it, the words of partition and blending. Um, in, in, this is the whole archetype of creation as partition and blending, you see, because it's either creation goes on in some way or other, what is it about? So you get something which is, a, and, and you, there's a division of this which enables you to bring them together again, you know, again. and this is the, this is the alchemy or something. Well, but it's like, the beginning of the Sumerian epic, I mean, you know, Enuma Elish, which translates when on high, when on high the gods have not been named and so on. You know, the first act of creation is, is separation of sky and earth, is with Anshar and Kishar, above horizon and below horizon. And why? Because it's to make a gap, it's to make a separation. Creation can't begin unless there's a separation to these distinctive things. And it, Mr. Bennett's language is, a, is to create a drama. Yeah? Yeah, I you like know, it. You know, physiologically, in the middle of the corpus callosum, where the, the two interconnect and there's some idea of women, it's more connected than in men, they're more separate, and all these possibilities. But it's, it's wonderful. Why? Um, and the, the many books being written out. Besides the one I mentioned, I heard about Sonny by Sonny called Tony Wright, um, because there is kind of line of interpretation which you said this is a mistake. The 
the sort of power went to the left brain, this was a mistake and it's created this kind of world and it's driven us out of Eden, out of paradise when we, everything was nice, you see. But I was sort of snagging, th not a snagging, a nagging thought in my, my mind that um, it made things more interesting to be driven out of, out of Eden. Well, in Eden everything was provided for us, wasn't it? And it was exactly. a paradise, we didn't have to really do anything but, yeah, you know, yeah, sit around true. and talk to the animals, which, you know, to me sounds quite nice. But it does. Being I mean, thrown yeah. out of Eden and then having to go and live for ourselves and then think yeah. for ourselves. Yes. Yeah. It's a hotbed of mythology. I mean, God, in everything, we're still in that state and the mysteries of our human evolution. We might have get on, on to this, we start with the feminine, you see, and, and this. Something uh, I want to dwell on a bit more. Oh, it's interesting to see. Like a very strong Christianity. Oh, the soul is feminine. Mm. So, what the spirit would be masculine in that sense? Mm -hmm. would it? Well, well, that's maybe true. I, guess. I, don't, I don't know. Throwing another I image, which is um, one of. You find many examples of Mr. Bennett had one which he took from the painter of cello and where you don't mention the masculine, you see the masculine is the um, is like the personality and, and so on. And he's portrayed always as the dragon slayer, the one who fights the dragon. And he is a f beautiful armor on this horse and this spirit dragon. And you see this painting by Cello. It's not only a Cello, other people too. Fighting in the dark and the dark. He's a brave warrior. And the maiden is standing by. And. As the knight as battles the, knight, the dragon. He's supposed to be saving her in the old yes. tradition, we think. But mm -hmm. that's, that's. Well, then you begin to see that she's holding a silken thread in her hand. And the end of the sequence where it's a little noose around the neck of the dragon. So she's already captured it. Well, you see, but this is... It, ben was really enraptured by this, and I got the taste of it from him. It represents the two worlds, and the fact that she is a soul. She's not the personality, the, ex the external person, who always imagines they're doing things, they have to fight things and so on. No, because in, in essence, you, you've, there is no problem. It's cool, way cool, you see. So it's in personality, you've got to fight the dragon, but dragon, in essence... Yeah. The outer one, yeah. the outer mm -hmm. self, and so, self and so on. So that's when, but, no, as illustrating the, you know, the, this thing of the maiden, it has, has to be the soul and it's taken many interpretations. But what I'm doing here is these, you know, books and history and mythology and all of that is, um, because it's like, for me, like a cauldron, it's kind of like, works in the human unconscious or... And, and it's out of this stuff which comes, these images, and it's... There's something about the work going on about finding, if we t accept that they have this power of drawing us on, you know, something which becomes needed at particular times, and so I come bending it round to Mr. Bennett and his concern with what his task was because for him I try to emphasize people who are interested in the Gertrude work they think it's all about getting your own eye and all the rest of it and it is Bennett said well this is just trivial getting your own eye and the point is you know it gives you a start and you begin to see what you should be doing you know getting your own eye is kids play it's kindergarten you know and so what is it you're doing and for him it was this he had and I puzzled about it because I don't know. I just had a few conversations with him, a few things he wrote and so on. He said he was to be involved in creating a new, a new sacred image for our time, as you see, what would be suitable for us. And this would be part of what he wanted to find, which was a way of worship which modern people could accept. And for him, it was an essential need, not just a nice idea, but an essential need. 
So not an essential need for the individual, an essential need for everybody? Uh, of humanity. Let's humanity. call it humanity and best word we, I've got for it, humanity. Uh, let's see. If you, when you look back on history, you see, again, you will always ask this question, and these things arose in the various religions. The various religions, you see, are almost composed around some sacred images, you know, like the Buddha or the Christ or you know, the Enlightenment or the, the Saviour or the, you know, the man of God, the prophet, even the idiot, or whatever it is, is, is something that has to be made concrete, made, made accessible to people. Mm -hmm. um, in the seminar I'm going to do, because you know me and I can't help following chance associations you know, about this, because I mean to introduce something modern, very modern, which is Schoenberg's offer of Moses and Aaron, which dealt with this conflict about the, some conflict about the images. I was in this offer of the two, it has the two brothers, you know, Moses and Aaron were brothers. And Aaron has given this beautiful singing tenor voice, and Moses is a very strong bass, somber voice. And because Aaron is always creating images of the golden calf to entice the Israelites, you know, to give them something to look at, uh, to inspire them, so to speak. And Old Moses is upset by all of this, as if this is distraction. Because in Judaism, as in Islam, at one time, in Christianity, there was this real tension, trouble about images. Really. So I to say, do not have images. Make no graven images. No. And in Islam, you're not supposed to depict prophet or God, God or any of the only, not even any people. And what you have is the calligraphy, which is the word. You see, and this is in in this offer because at the end of the second act, Moses is in despair and he cries out to God, "O word that I lack, I need the word." Um, I've thrown that in partly because just my associations, but going back to the nature of an image, you see. There is also in the image a word, like I say, Christ, you see. And this in the name of is important, you know, giving it the name. There is, um, involved with a few people who bring people along to something like a, a spirit journey, uh, Entering into some other world in some way or other, in one's feelings or actually, it doesn't really matter. And I always say they take this fortune you had to undertake this journey in the name of. And it says you, if you're a Christian, say in the name of Jesus, and you enter into it, or the Buddha, or whatever it is, in the name of. So I was thinking for an image and say there's, there's this the name, the word is there, which can be treated as abstract, you know, just a word, you know, say God, G-O-D, Allah, A-L-L-A-H, whatever it is, you know, Allah, Flam. Um, the words are very powerful. Oh, yes. <coughs> but it, well, just the throwing that in, you see, with the, with the image, you see, yes. Uh, let's see. There you go. See, in these monotheistic religions, there was those this trans they would just, would just have the word, because the picture would be something like a veil, you know, getting in the way. And, and, and you know, say it was in all the three religions. In, is, in Christianity, of the iconoclast, I think they were the core, they, they said, really, images were bad, evil, uh, because you were putting your attention away from God onto and something, the image, yes, onto the image this itself. Is something I've Idolatry. About, yes. mm -hmm. But then, not. I don't think everybody that looks at the image necessarily is worshiping that image. But in some religions, they would have the image because they believe that having that image of that God, the God could <coughs> come into that. Yes. <coughs> into that image. That's it's, right. um, like it's not invoking. It's Eve. Eve, oh no, invoking the God into the image, isn't it? You had yeah. a, let's say, a statue of yes. one of the Egyptian gods and you was worshipping that, then that God would be in that statue for that time. That's nice, because then 
between the, to see if an outside is so a fabrication, making something, putting it up there, but you're getting this counter flow of it actually being the real thing. Mm. It starts off as um, a representation but becomes a real thing. I think that's possibly true. Because I wonder when the Christians and the Jews and the Islam stopped the said no icons was perhaps because they thought it was someone who thought you could only think about God with because God's unknowable. That's right, yeah. And so yeah. that's why they didn't want any images. But yeah. I think it's good for the stories that are in the Bible, the Quran and things to have images of the stories maybe for, yes. to, to remind people. Because the picture tells a, a thousand mm -hmm. words as they say. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. But you know here you know, one of the rationales or properties of these images is is it like it represents what one is after. You know. It uh, I'm thinking because I'm starting to think about this image called the Insomni Kamil, I think it which means the perf the perfect man. Now we've come to a man image. Um, in Christianity we have a form of it in, in the imitation of Christ, which is Thomas Kempis, I think, in his book, Imitation of Christ. Uh, and it means giving you something which to focus on, which gives you an idea of direction. Yeah, so something to attain to. Certainly to attain to, that's why it looks like this. And so we have in words, you know, like Islam, the 99 names of God and the att attributes of God and so on, and make it tangible to enable you to to see how oh, Wow, how much time have we got? Hmm, keep going if you want. Okay, well, I did because I'm wondering about moving towards um, what I believe mm, Mr. Bender was concerned with. Um, I would be intrigued to know you were saying that you, you and Mr. Bennett used to work, uh, I think you were saying you was working on how to make iconic art. No, no, I didn't. I said he was concerned with the evolution of a sacred image, right, which okay. um, in this case is uh, nothing artistic or tangible about it, and it, uh, I'm hoping we I uh, can get towards that realm, because uh, it is in one of his talks, I mean, he literally puts it straightforwardly in the image of God, and he even had it one time a lecture called The Image of God in Work. And his, I always recommend people to read that book. It's called um, Sacred Influences, I think. With the last year of his life, he explored these things because he has this question about the work. And we might move to that and say, is work a sacred image? You know, you know you say, well, you can define it. We do it as this is what this guy Gurdjieff talked about. Is the um, our transformation, its methods, its you can find some explanations for it. But he really struggled because it, I think he, he never resolved it. I wonder if you can see what I'm getting, what I'm struggling with here. You know, you know, talk about the work, you know, it, in a way to say, is the work God? Hmm. You know, this is really ultimate. He said, he said this, but he said, the one thing he's seeing about the work, he said, well, it's it's very difficult to get caught up in the things you do get caught up with God. You can't start talking about Mr. Work or something, you know. Because <laughs> you know, it doesn't quite work, you know, can't read it. So it really, and he was attracted to that because it, it was, um, he, he saw in it there was something you know, really intelligent about that and why God might have adopted that. And people did it because there were very various discourses. You've got the fourth way as one way. Harmonious development of now, but the work is you get the capital W in there. Maybe it was alchemical, the great work, and so on. But no, I'm thinking, you know, damn it, I'm thinking more and more. This is a bloody sacred image. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and because it's something you're looking at, you're pondering on. I'm pondering on. And hopefully, mm. getting some, you're giving something to it and getting mm. something back. And but yeah, and of course it's I say of course it's not. I'm, traditional icon which is supposed to represent a being. Yeah. 
a true sacred beings, sacred individuals, if you like. It's more than that. Now, this is very interesting. You know what I mean? It's more than that because it's not um, the work is is you couldn't could you have imagine could you paint an icon of the work? You know, kind of what is it? What it look like? There's some kind of puzzle here. You see, because obviously the work, which is a word, so to speak, matters a great deal to a lot of people, but it's only in that stage of being a word. But it's got to be it always has that aspect and we meet it, we, you know, we've been to these conferences or all everything and so on, people sometimes get caught up in this and thinking, well, as you say, we can describe the work is, what it consists and what it does. But if we stick with our theme here and say, well, treating work as a sacred image would enable us to pause with ascribing it to being something, um, I'd say, that we can put together or assemble, it's not like a machinery or something like that, there's something in it which is, because um, we, you know, I don't know if you ever come across this, Debbie, but you know, we used to have this, you know, we used to say weird things like, it's the work that works, you know. Yes, you I've know. heard people say that. Yeah, yeah. you have, you and people have been, even weird things like, they've been poisoned by the work, uh, kind, which gives it kind of an in independent reality. And because you, and then this thing, I remember one of Bennett's friends one time, um, I don't know if I mentioned his name, and he suddenly was talking about the Gertrude work, and he got very angry and he said, This is not somebody's work, it's a work. The, would it be the work or well, a work? Well, it's like the, you the know, work, because yeah, the, okay. but the, as long as you're putting the the in front, you make it sacred. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the one and only work. And it, and, and you just, I'm mean, just, just randomly just talking to you, thinking about this, become really, wow. Because, you know, why is it, it's something that people do, but it's also something that's done to them, you know? And so there's, I must go back to those talks. So I, was, I knew they were significant because, like, those the last talks he gave, and things were changing till towards the end of his life, and he was understanding things a different way. And I, but in coming to come round to what he was also connected with, which wasn't the work, which or which had another name. But, but I'm still, you know, really excited by this because um, it's weird. Because sometimes I said to people, you know, what do you think if you, you know, say religious, and say, can we equate the work with the Holy Ghost? And so you know, this is the nearest thing. What is the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, the, the one who came after Christ, the one who will come after me? Because uh, uh, the Holy Ghost is also unseen. Unseen, yes. And that's what the work is unseen because you can't see it. That's right. Saying. That's right. But it enters into things which mm. like the one of the things Pentecost and the gifts of the Holy Ghost and so on. Which is a beautiful scene, Pentecost. You know, the, the tongues of fire entering. And also how the church itself was supposed to be an expression of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was the one of the Trinity responsible for community. And I'm getting more and more excited about this. This is really, really good, you know. And the... Um, yeah, that was the Christ of the salvation, but this aspect of the people, the congregations, the sort of work which Paul did, um, was that I mean, it's like an inspiration? Well, I used to speak, because I, I did a degree in divinity, and one of the things wow. we used to talk about, about the Holy Ghost, was, as a, uh, an idea, was was the Holy Ghost perhaps originally the female aspect of the Trinity? Because oh. you've got the father, the son, yeah. but surely there should be a mother. Yeah, something is definitely missing. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, and perhaps over time the patriarchal system mm. wanted to get rid of the female. And, oh, definitely. But they couldn't get rid of what it represents, what she represented, yes, yes, so yes. she became the Holy Ghost, right. which, you know, is the unseen. Oh. I don't know, so, there's well, we've gone here. back to the eternal family, and he brought, <laughs> and she snuck in again because Jung wanted to add her as a fourth, and uh, this was Bennett's way out too in his treatment of religion. He made it as a fourth, and now you're opening up all these expansive things, you know. Oh wow! 
uh, and how you know, of course for you know two like Christians I mean the Virgin Mary is so amazing it's also interesting because it was so I think it I was very surprised when I, sh I asked Francis up to check this out it wasn't to very recently that the Catholic Church actually incorporated the divinity of Mary into it. I know it's only recently they incorporated how important Mary Magdalene was and accepting her as one of the no, first no, no, apostles, no, but I don't know about, no, but, I no, thought no, Mary, had all, Mary, Mary the mother had always been But she became easy, what happened, you know, it was already a thousand years ago, you know, it just it seemed amongst the people, that uh, uh, Christian people, they just naturally want, were, were doing that and uh, that, um, it took some time to get in theology. Dun Scotus, a theologian, uh, he was very, he devoted himself to Mariology, but I think he was really accepted until later. But let's not get distracted from that. But oh, Monde must, must be dis distracted because of the extraordinary things Venet was exploring in his dramatic universe at the end. You know, even drawing parallels which could upset a lot of religious people between Mary and. Uh, the Quran. Uh, you know. she's in the Quran, isn't she? Well, she is in the Quran, but I meant the whole thing, and, and, and I think I must look at this up because I'm careless sometimes, even, even the Prophet, um, because he was concerned, and this, this must be part of our modern sacred image. You know, this whatever stupid shit happened with the wars between the religions is something which needs to be addressed. You know, because people can deadly talk about the unity of religions, but it's, it's like you have to find a sacred image, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, which can embody that that unity. And referring back to Gurdjieff's um, four prophets, you know, in, I don't know if you, I can't remember if you've ever done the movements. I've not done the movements. No, it's, no. Like, it's one of his things in which we were just doing it in Spain. We take the ones and it was sort of Jesus. Buddha, Muhammad, and Lama. Lama, yeah. Lama is this one. And each has a certain gesture, and it's like this is Muhammad. Muhammad, and they speak the words and so on. Uh, but it, it reminded me how much it was just this unity of religion. But how the unity of religions needs to be um, it was created, uh, yeah, established, and so it might be related to. A sacred image which puts it in impossible conundrums. Who, 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 like, who creates a sacred image? Because you've got to have some sense in which the image is not not a guy somewhere, or even a super clever guy making it up, you know, putting it on the market, so to speak. It's something which emerges of itself. It must be something like this. Um, Was it? So you're sort of saying a sacred image that represents all religions, that all religions would accept? Well, the, well now at this time, you know, I'm just thinking, it's, I mean, the, it's a sensible theme we got, the sacred image in the 21st century, but for God's sake, you know, literally for God's sake, we ought to get, get that, you know, being subject to this fragmentation and separation and this. It's a cam, you know, it's a, it's a can be something like a new kind of sacred image, and then it, it must surely include that role see, to, to do it. But one other thing, amongst many about this modern age, you know, like in, in the Western Sound, is most of the people have lost any religious sense, um, and everybody's boasting about how they don't believe in God and any of that kind of stuff, you know. In you this see, rational world. <laughs> yes, the rational world precisely and all that. But then you, but it's a curious thing, and so whatever emerges has got to be on a new basis. Like, you imagine somebody, you know, as we get now, all these books about what's the problem to work and how to solve it, how the new thing, and they declare themselves a prophet. And I mean, I'm most suspicious about all of this, you know, it's not, surely not, it's got it. But then how can I say it's going to happen of, it, of itself? Oh, and I look, and for me, you know, my background is physics and science. 
And I think you mentioned, uh, was it you mentioning that? Well, physics or science? Of, um, you're talking about David Attenborough? No, it wasn't me. It was somebody, just a few of you, see, there it is, maybe it was a little spirit with me, <laughs> I think. But, you know, and it's not like this, you know, you read the newspapers where the only pleasurable, fun thing is about scientific discovery. Just about everything else in human affairs is just terrible and miserable and foul and stupid, you know. Mm -hmm. But this is, and you suddenly think, because I take it, and I, I mean about it, I'm, it's rare, I mean, I'm maybe completely wrong, I take science as a modern form of revelation. And I think we, I think God enabled us to have science because that was a way of, of us experiencing and seeing some things which were. Well, in ancient times, science and religion went hand in hand, didn't they? You're they? right, that's right. So yeah. maybe there's a big cycle in coming back to this and said, so we've got to find something which coincides and so pausing but not forgetting I'm getting all little goosebumps in my legs now I'm going to think about but, um, in a good way I hope oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, you know, about this thing about the work which I haven't really it's so obvious but before speaking I haven't really got it but about this other thing and which is what is this other thing and, and uh, good but then it was nature that is now become fairly common as an idea mm -hmm. and going back to Gurdjieff he we know he had this kind of friendly way of talking about him he talked about great nature all the time great nature and sometimes with great respect you know and something very wise and Sort of independent of people, that kind of thing. And uh, Bennett took this up. Well, and we know we have all the, all these ecological movements now, and this incredible thing about saving the planet. Uh, I talk about imagery, you know, the images of the whales or the coral reefs. Uh, all of this sort of thing, which are like uh, almost images of hell and death and destruction. Why is it coming up? Because there's some kind of um, sense of need. As they say, well, it's survival, yeah, but I think it's more than that. Um, well, maybe because more and more people are concerned about the destruction of the planet as well. Yes. Well, that's a survival thing. I think there's a, mm. More than so, you can say, well, it just makes common sense, as it does, to actually, you know, stop behaving sensibly about things and not follow these insane politicians and uh, selfishness or in ourselves as well into something which is about not just survival. I was even going to say it was like it's love. Um, you know, thought coming to my mind, and let us be clear, just a thought in my imagination, sort of, because about people are discovering love in relationship to nature because it has this aspect of some kind of impersonality in it. It's not just lovey-dovey, you know, not just people. There's a something about getting beyond people. You know, almost one could put it that in the previous religions, they would still remain with people, you know, the us, mm. and this kind of... Well, before it would have been perhaps a you could either have sexual love, brotherly love, your mm. family love, where yeah. this is more of a, a compassionate love of some kind. Something which is, you feel is actually in the nature of reality itself. It's not just a, you can imagine something between humans is just a, or as a human thing which is, came out of human evolution, it's subjective and so mm. on, but this in its nature. And one of the things that Benny went on and on with his students attention about this, uh, because it was, he kept in the kind of good of tradition in a way which says that we don't indulge in sentimentality, it's not so much about being a nice person or lovey-dovey or whatever it is, but because you see something, and, and then Ben kept hammering this extraordinary thing that nature loves us. 
he said, this, he, he said, realizing this, he said, was the crux. Was most people happily going on about how much they love nature. Hmm. He says, that's fine. But the crux was to understand that nature loves us. Give my little explanation for it, all it's worth, which is much, which is because if you go on about how much you love nature, you're still putting yourself first. <laughs> how compassionate I am, how deep I am, how spiritual I am, I can love nature. Then he's the one sort of metaphorically so gives them a good smack. Did <laughs> <laughs> you see it? You know, and you mock people, you know, sitting in the meadow and nice fires looking out and thinking how much they love nature and you know, it's useless. Um, now this turning around, I'll add something to it because it may be very peculiar to Bennett and uh, people into Goethe won't recognize it at all. And that is to say that he was a devout Christian and so on. But he was more than that through the work. He had this, and I'm going to say what this is and not just go on about this, 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 and in the abstract, this particular thing about um, the higher powers, um, which is, I go back to from time to time. I forget to go back to, and I think it's very simple, very direct, but it's very strong, and that is to say. He said, always, 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 always assisted. The higher powers want to give everything they can to us. Give it freely. But the problem is us. And he said, you won't believe it. He said, the problem is we don't want to accept it. Well, don't we have to go up to them, open ourselves up to them? And well, that's what you're okay, saying. Okay, well, open yourself fine, you see. But still, you see, you put yourself first. We have to open ourselves up to it. Mm -hmm. You see, it's a subtle difference. You go back to that, to go to the point of seeing and accepting what is all being offered now. Is it not get to them now? And he put it in the most extreme way, which is in the form of Christianity, because that's his nature. So it may be not useful for a lot of people. He said most important fact, historical fact, of the last 2,000 years has been that mankind, humankind, has not accepted its salvation. Mm -hmm. And I've dwelt on this uh, very, very grandly because what he was portraying is to do the sacred image. And the sacred image, in the traditional sense, that in colloquial terms it takes you out of yourself that's his value, into another realm of possibility, that it depends on this, that the higher powers act ahead of us. You see? And you, in a sense, you have to sort of get to them, means you miss it. It's already here, we just have to realize it. It's already here, and this, I don't know how much you know, the background of Bennett and the other proponents of Gurdjieff's work had this problem because he wanted to accept there was this love from God, you know, of mankind and people of various kinds. And, and, and the background, main trend, background thing was all about it all depends on us, on our own effort, which has such laudable merit to it. You know, we've got to do it. You can't just sit on our backsides and all this kind of thing. <laughs> but he said, he said, yes, 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 we've got to do our own way, but it comes, the, it's got to, in a sense, begin by accepting what is given. Because uh, you can see the way. I mean, this is a kind of corrupting addition to what you were saying. Uh, if you go around, volumes from it's, it's up to us entirely, then it, they turn the work into their own image. And I've, I've seen it, like people take the work as sort of like self-improvement. I mean, this is, for me, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's put, almost beside the point. 
I mean, who cares? I mean, so this, uh, I mean, but it's a kind of self-improvement in, in that but it's teaching you to look at yourself. But it's whether you look at yourself and, and better, you know, or become aware of what you're doing or how you are or why yeah, you're like yeah. it. Yeah, you see, well, well, let me try to put it this way. By referring to a vine expert, John Harrodin Rumi. <laughs> I like to know, so much of his expressions are divine. I mean, forget, well, this is one about you know, the guy, very devout guy, Muslim, going Allah, 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 like this, he's calling out him. And then Iblis, which is a name for the devil, mm -hmm. says, oh, you're an idiot. You know, how long have you been doing this? You know, and the guy said, well, I'm devout, I do it every day. So ever get an answer? <laughs> I'm not sure. See, <laughs> and so what? Well, mm, think about it. So he so dropped this seed of, which is maybe, of the doubt into him. Doubt. And then okay. comes onto the stage this other character, um, my favourite character in Islam, El Hilal, the green one, the green man, and he said, "Man, you know." Another said, also calling the poor man an idiot. He said, "Yeah." <laughs> Don't you understand? And I said, what? That Allah has always been replying to you. He said, what do you mean? I, I didn't hear him. He said, you say the name of Allah? Do you think you could say the name of Allah from yourself? It is only Allah who says the name of Allah. That's it. So that's the big thing. But you, this so it's happening the divine within you, or allowing it to come in yeah. you, yeah. Well, or it's no, already in you. Yeah, it's always, God is always ahead of us, and it isn't a matter of catch-up, but there is that, maybe it's a confusing image, I can't help doing this, there's a beautiful expression about uh, throwing your, your heart ahead of you and then catching up with it. There's something like that. So, but it still has this thing about throwing your heart ahead of you. But this is what is done, I believe, in the our encounter with the sacred image, because you, you you're allowing your heart to go into this wider realm. You know, it's, it's taken up by itself. And if you get this realm, I am making my heart go, and you lose it because you're back into I. And every you use the word I, whatever it is, it's going to bring you back to the material world of causes and effects and so on. So for me, I mean, I'm getting into what matters to me, you know, my subject, you know, me, just me, Blake, being me, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. you know, where is the starting point? With, uh, not with um, I at all. I is a delusion, you know, that kind of thing. So, big thing in this, that's uh, the, is the conversation, the association, the kind of this point of poss possibility, the emergence of a new sacred image. I mentioned Mr. Bennett and I have many puzzles and many unknowns about this. And not that I say you can go sit in a study and invent a new sacred image. He gave lectures about what he felt was unconditional nature, you know, which is an idea about, about this all, and he tried to communicate that to people. Um, and because he's always find a way of being, helping people to contact this which is already working. And he said this extreme thing at one point. He said that there are, he used the word in his precise religious way, this word was supernatural. People use the word supernatural to mean the occult, things like clairvoyance and that kind of thing. That's just the spirit world, you know. He was okay with the spirit world, okay, with the dreams and all that. But the spirit of the supernatural, so there are supernatural energies at work. And um, I still I had these conversations with him, and I said, but, you know, this so called work on oneself is okay, it's got a. But it never really gets you anywhere at all, none of it does. Um, there's these supernatural energies would do it. And so he was aware in saying this that. Um, 
maybe only a very few people would take him seriously. <laughs> I see what you're saying, that it's trying to, it's because supernatural is something that's not natural to us, isn't it? Or it is natural to us, but it's it's the next, mm. perhaps, level up or something. Yeah. So it's trying to to reach them higher energies or the, or what he's mm. calling the supernatural. Mm. Mm. Or because we're just living a mundane life, we're not quite in touch with what is no, the supernatural. Yeah. Oh God, I, I'm sorry, oh David, I'm going go back at all my memories and associations <laughs> and conversations. It's just tremendous for me, I don't mean anything to anybody else, but it's so, so tremendous to me about this, this. I get so upset in a way about, you know, Goju groups and all these kind of groups, and they talk about working on themselves and so on, they go on for year after year, struggling and struggling and work on themselves and they observe themselves and all the rest of it. But it, I think it's, it's like, it's like missing the bus, so to speak. The, we don't start the work, the work has begun, you find that thread, where has it begun, where is it, where is it open itself? It's, uh, you know, seeing, the, like, um, make it sound like it's stupid, like divine shining being, Offering out of the hand, and then the the human being uh, saying, "Have you got a license?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever it is, you, you know, it doesn't come in this form. But you know. But then maybe these Gurdjieff groups, if people just stay with them for a while to get something out of it, so they go on to find it for themselves. Well, like Gurdjieff used to say, "You know, you had your time with me, off you go." Well, he did, didn't he? Yeah. That's right, because they, they, they just repeat. Mm. And that's and that's a fundamental practical point. And Benny was very keen on this. He said, like in the group, you know, you know really take seriously carrying on after three years at least. You know, and really and take uh, a good look at what's going on you know, and do something different. Yes, because yeah. you can't be in the same class forever. Otherwise, you're just repeating mm. the same old but lessons. Yeah, but a lot of people do yes. stay in the same class forever, mm. you know, and they die in the same class forever, and so on. Well, you see, it's not against anything, but for a time and so on. And in there is then this, but the sacred images. And I come back to the work. Yeah. I myself have argued against use of the word work. I was even in Spain talking about this and say a better, more sensible word would be action. And I give various reasons, but they come from physics, so I don't think they mean much to anybody else. But that I had to admit there's something about this word work which is sacred. You know, do, do, I don't know if you feel that. No, I do when it's with a capital W and it's to do with doing the Gurdjieff work, mm -hmm. it's sacred to me. But then you see you added the Gurdjieff work. It's Gurdjieff, you've got a person in there doing it. Um, well, I suppose I'm saying that to differentiate it from, you know, just going to your everyday job. Oh, I see. Day-to-day yeah, day yeah, job yeah. work. Okay, it gives you a thing. Work with a du little yeah, W. Yeah. So, but because okay. I suppose it is... Yeah. He hasn't, Gurdjieff himself never gave a name to it, did he? He called it the fourth way once, but he, I don't think he was saying that's what this is going to be called. No, I'm, you know, I've wondered about it and I'm very irresponsible. I never really followed it up and checked it out. Um, well, from what I've seen myself, it's bec I wonder if people took it because he kept saying about working on yourself. Yeah, working on yourself and extended, and the work, and, but since, yeah. Well, let's hope we can look into this. Yeah, you? maybe someone will send us the answer. Well, oh, no, <laughs> Not God the for, answer, thank God you. forbid any, an <laughs> any answer to that. But I just want to stay with my own feeling of the other words. Like, because it was, the, I think it was a passage which had it with me. You know, it was very important for me, a, a seminar he gave on the, the spiritual psychology a long time ago, is that, and there's a book about it. And then he revised it, and he went through it, and he talked about having a dream and and this vision of the work, and he saw that he came to the point of reality is the work, the work is reality. Uh, and he saw that it was unlimited, infinite. Uh, it's very, and I recommend you to read it, and get older and read it, because it's so stunning. And it was like a raw thing came up, came over him. It wasn't worked out or anything. A raw thing. There was this, and it was. No, I've got. I'm sorry. I got really hooked on this. The work is the sacred image. 
Um, but I suppose work is a reality. The work would be a reality if you won't, if you perform the work properly. You would wake up and see. No, it's more than everything. You know, it's more than more, much more. So it's a complete identity. Because uh, part of it can be explained, and I think we're, we're reaching towards it, part of it can be explained in terms of. You know, I came to me in a certain form a few days ago about all of this you know, beyond personality and essence of it as well, in which everything that's there is being created. It's not like a world, you know, we accept the world here. Well, you've got these things hanging around, there's a bloody suitcase by the door, you know, you're sitting on a chair there, and you can get the world as objects, and they, what do they do? They just sit around. They're going to knock into each other. But in this third world, as it's called, um, they're not there until they're made to be there. It's, it's, it's the creating world, mm -hmm. not the created world. You know. And so, but finding this is maybe then you get the demand again for the sacred images. It's not like a simple idea of the sacred image, like there's a picture of a saint with a halo. That's, but that can have enormous value. Like this one, our friend Tony Smith did of the baptism of Christ, showing these holy people. But we are looking at what, how we can form an image of the work, which is not an explanation of the work. So I've got very really excited about this. Wow! And where do we turn? You go want to make the Holy Ghost feminine, <laughs> and then there's this idea of, of great nature. Then, but you see, it's all Bennett. And this, thing, it's all the, this is the thing, the turning around. We, you know, only enough we start from I. Even, even I'm a bad person. I'm an inadequate person, but it's still I. And the I comes first. As long as the I comes first, you're in a world subject to certain laws. Now, just stopping saying the word I is not going to change much. But it's this, the seeing of that this I, which appears in our grammar, is empty. There's nothing, and it's to do with time. And my Bennett, and not only Bennett, a lot of people in this way, puzzle about time. And one of the reasons is that when does it begin? I suddenly realize now, I'm referring to Spain again. I was a session I started to going on and on about beginning, what is the beginning, and then people were wondering, what's he going on about the beginning? Why doesn't he just begin the session? I'm still talking about it. But I suddenly thought, I became impassioned by it, you know, what, you know, like we're talking now. But when did our talk begin? You know, I, I say it was um, it's in some invisible point. You know, we had some emails, we talked about it, you came along, we chatted. You had a cup of tea, you had your orange well, juice, and we said, well, we're going to begin then, and we said, I think, switch it on. And we describe it in this way, but let me see. But the beginning is an act of creation, it's just, you know? And we can have that. Yeah, yeah. But that act of creation began with a word, according yeah. to the Holy Scriptures. Scriptures, yeah. So that comes back to the what you were saying earlier about um, saying things, speaking things. Mm. So maybe it is a word that creates things, which is why spells are so mm. important, or because spells create whatever they want from whatever the intention of the spell is. So maybe that's why words are seen differently to how sacred pictures are revered. So. Yeah. I told them that Moses gets his word. <laughs> and I did just want to say also, um, the swordsman, would you say the swordsman's picture of, that he made for Gurdjieff's uh, institute, would that be icon an iconic piece of art? Or he's Which got one? The angel and the devil with Gurdjieff's oh, face and then the all the other things. and all that, yeah. Well, that's the, yeah, why, why not? Yeah, yeah that would be a true modern icon, I think. Yeah, or at least a 20th century icon, that's when it was done, yeah. I uh, wouldn't mind that. Uh, I'm, I'm noting the time. Yes, I know the time. We, I know we want to wrap this up, don't we, and, and this kind of thing. So I'm worried, I don't know why I'm doing this, like looking for the odd loose end. <laughs> you know, maybe. 
Do you have a, a, a conclusion or a last word? That's what I mean, you know. Mm. But that's another thing, you see, besides beginning and look at ending. Uh, I think people are, if I may, may say so, be rude as I am rude to be rude, people are even worse on ending than they are on beginning. <laughs> because uh, it's, it's, it, it, I, I can never find a way to express it. You don't know, understand why I've gone on about this. To finish something is incredible. But is anything ever finished? Well, you see, yes, and by decision. That means that this, well, this comes up, and it's sort of approximation towards an answer for you. you know. It's like in a work of art, you say, it's, and it's ambiguous, difficult consequence most of the time, you say, it is done. Now that it is done is integral to what that work of art is. See? And you can see from the outside, you say, why didn't he stop there? You could have done something more, whatever it was. You know? But that act is it, it's, it's like making the canvas, you know, you know picking up the paint. You know? you see, no, 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 you know, because you, you, you do it, you create things and so on, you look at it and say, it's done. Don't you think that's no? Important? I don't. I don't think any piece of mine's ever finished, oh, and I feel there's yeah. never a way of. Oh, you have no. to. You, as okay. an artist, I have to say, right, I can't work on this anymore. No. Otherwise, I'll be doing this same piece for the rest of my no, life. And I have spoken no. to other artists who feel no. the same way. That their so art is no. never finished. Well, I see. Well, well, anyway, just to add other flavors into this, it's like eschatology, the end things, the end of days, and so on. How can the universe end? And what is the ultimation? Not the ultimation, the the ultimate, uh, the ultimate realization, uh, the end. When it comes up on the screen, fan, <laughs> the end. You know, uh, no. Well, this leave it as a mystery. But we want to, uh, some kind of last thing. I just want to say in my forthcoming seminar about all of this. You know, it was coupled with the. The idea of the sacred image was coupled with the idea of movements of the soul. I wanted to bring that in because previously I looked into, as best I could, the language of gesture and associating it, because of my background in Bennett, with his ideas that um, gesture is the language of the will. And this is followed up when I talk about movements of the soul. And I think one of them movement of the soul I mean, look at is actually can be called worship it's a movement of the soul um, it's not going holy um, holy holy art thou uh, that kind of thing yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that sort of thing you know, it's the this is it's a side of this connection with the chaya whatever it is as you trying to prompt me every now and then is that we um, have a role to play ourselves, ourselves, and this, this, this act, until we get into a world where you know, the, the, the actually we can, the soul can move, and because it's, we we're then doing playing our part, you know what's what's our part, you know, you get, it can start from simple ideas of somebody in the Spanish one suggested with I would agree with you know, about things like gratitude, but how do you give thanks? You know, you see what I'm doing in my hands. How do I give thanks? You know, because we have to manifest. We have to do these things and so on. Mm. It isn't just mental. You know. It isn't just an outside ritual. We got to. You got to feel it. Yeah. And as you were saying, like you're using your hands, we want to mm. somehow use our body in that as well. Yes. Yeah. You can, because there's something which sort of leads us out, which is you know, that our will is kind of. It's the whole of us, you know, and it's like, you know, and then you see my hand there, you're doing this. Doing your gesture. Yes, yes. And I hope that some element will come in because it's what we do almost unconsciously, which also has tremendous symbolic power, you know, for us. But it's nice to take these things seriously and look at them. So, let's say, yeah, it's like, how to say thank you? Uh, 
maybe people here should get a point of saying thank you to great nature. <laughs> it's part of it. How do we do this? Uh, that's, that's a good question. How do we say thank you to great nature? Mm. You know, do we just appreciate it and will it fill it from film? Mm. I don't know. Because you see, we have a feeling, we have a thought, but there's something we want a bit more. Somehow mm. connection with it. Yeah, connection. Mm. Yeah, connection. I think to get this here. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe you know it could be you start planting a tree or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, thank you, Debbie. No, thank you, Tony. Tony, quickly tell us about um, your next uh, seminars and group works that you're giving. You're giving one next month in the USA. In Claymont, yes, that's the one on. Uh, the movement of the soul in in the sacred image. And that's going to be in May 2019. So if someone was interested, they would go to your website, the diversity.com. Dot org. Dot org. Diversity mm -hmm. dot org. Yeah, yeah. Thank. With well, that one, and it's you know short notice now. Um, but you have other seminars throughout the year, don't you? Yeah, well, we have. have in one is in Spain, which is about the in August about the three centres. Uh, we were talking before we started the recording about this and also another one to do with the diversity which is on the idea of the Ark and Debbie here was saying is it the Ark of the Covenant and it was uh, first of all saying Noah's Ark and what is was, well, let's start being naive and it's all we put on our little ship to ride out the storm you know, to future generations we do things like now have seed banks and all this this kind of thing recordings and well I thought it was an interesting question I said all I know at this point we're going to look at this and what is the connection with the Ark of the Government and how the Ark was of course put in the Holy Temple at one point and so it's both this Holy Holy Holius and the vessel it has the same word in it I don't know why probably somebody knows it can tell me uh, but it's going to involve, I have a feeling, my revered theoretical ancestor, William, William Blake, yeah. and, his, and his prophecies and his ways. So. One of my favourite people, William Blake. I, I love his art, I love his books, I love his poetry. Yeah. Uh, he, he created sacred images. Mm. So there he, you are, we ought to have begun with him. Well, maybe we'll do him next time as well then. All right, yeah. bring him in. <laughs> Good old Bill. Yes. <laughs> and also, just wanted to say we, we've recorded this on St George's Day because we mentioned George and the Dragon oh, earlier. Right. It's it's the twenty third of April. Of course, that the thing about <laughs> Labour Party is embarrassed again. They said yesterday was St George's Day. <laughs> today, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got the date wrong. It's today. <laughs> today. Well, it's wonderful because my son is called George, and so I must. Uh, Congratulate him on his name, <laughs> on his name day. I know, you know, for me, a strong thing with St George is that for me, I also identify him with Michael, Archangel Michael. And there's a story I read about this once, and I was looking a little bit about how Michael is supposed to save the life of St George seven times. I, oh, I don't know that story. I know, I just came up on those things, and I, you know, now I've forgotten where I found it, but it's weird. But also, the that symbol of the chap on a horse, you know, with this, the lance and stabbing the dragon. You can also find sometime versions of St. Michael doing that because he's the warrior. That's right. And, and this kind of thing. And he's the, some people take him as the guide, the, 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 the true guide of England is St. Michael. And you know, <coughs> but this Michael line coming out from, through Delphi in, in to cross into Ireland and and the south of England and all that kind of Michael stuff is there. Yes, yeah. the Michael and Mary lines. Yeah. Oh, you know that one, yeah, yeah. they're going around Glastonbury. And I've, really. I've bought some of the Michael line as well. Have you? Yes, I, I like that kind of thing. I like to try and uh, understand what these energies are, mm. or, you know, because mm. I think that's a lot of why the megalithic stones were placed on them, was to try yeah, and... There is some of them. Yeah, yeah, something to do with that. We did that in the university, we did a tour along part of that Michael line, so five years ago, six years ago, yeah, and these beautiful little churches. But one of the other things about Michael, St. Michael and George, yeah. I never used to know what the difference was between them until, um, again, from doing my degree, one of the teachers, mm. put, well, one of the priest teachers pointed out 
to know whether it's St Michael, Michael always has wings. And if there's no wings, that's George. Okay, that's all. <laughs> that's, 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 that's how you tell the difference. My God. <laughs> it seems obvious, you can say it, isn't it? Yeah. Ah. And also, but it started with St George was supposed to be an Egyptian, wasn't he? Well, he's also the patron saint of Portugal and many other countries. They have no are... right to have our mic, uh, George, you know. So By George. He was doing it all over the world. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank you very much, Tony. It's yeah. been a blast as always, and I look forward to doing oh. this again soon. Okay.